The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. When it comes to human trafficking here in Ontario, as Cassandra mentioned, this is only scratching the tip of the iceberg. And when we're talking about the tip of the iceberg, Victim Services Toronto supports about 400 people just last year. Then, later on the agenda. Thinking about climate change positively, and there are 120 universities across the world that are doing that. That's, that's what still gives me hope. Shocking statistics show that Ontario has the second highest rates of human trafficking in Canada at a higher rate than the national average. Is our province doing enough to combat human trafficking? With us in studio to discuss, Kelly Beal, Crown Counsel, who leads the legal support program for victims of human trafficking through the Ministry of the Attorney General. Jasminder Sekhon, Policy Advisor, Stakeholder Relations and EDI Manager for Victim Services Toronto. Cassandra Diamond, founder and director of Bridge North Women's Mentorship and Advocacy Services, and Gary Bazaar, Detective, Human Trafficking Unit, London Police Service. And we're grateful to have all of you joining us here at the table tonight at TVO for an important and timely conversation. To get us started, Sheldon, our director, I wonder if you would bring up these graphics so we can share some of these disturbing numbers. StatsCan has a report out on this. It's quite alarming. If we look at a map of the province, and I'll go through this for those listening on podcast and can't see the map, these numbers become uh, very concerning for Ontarians. The Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking launched a hotline service in 2019 that reveals 67% of Canadian human trafficking incidents reported to the hotline from the years 2019 to 22 occurred here in the province of Ontario. Two-thirds. Following Ontario, the closest numbers are 10% in Alberta, 9% in BC, and 7% in Quebec. But Ontario stands out for all the wrong reasons. Cassandra, react to that if you would. Thank you for bringing this topic up to your audience. This stat is a stat that um, has been ongoing for a, for a lot of years. Um, as, as we've woken up to the issue of human trafficking, I do want to say that um, we've woken up to the issue of human trafficking, but now we're becoming aware of numbers that have really always existed. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what I do find is that the stat that you've provided does indicate that Ontario, uh, unfortunately, uh, has a huge amount of, of, of sex trafficking uh, here in our province. Um, at the same time, we do know that um, it's still the tip of the iceberg. Well, let me pick up on that with Gary. Why Ontario? It's a real outlier if you look at that national map. I, I would agree, and I would agree with what, what Cassandra was saying, um, that there's so much awareness out there now, and Ontario is doing so much, with the, not, not just the police services, um, obviously bias, but the ministry, um, the community partners, they're, they're doing so much in Ontario. And not to say they're not, that's not happening in other provinces, but we are, I, th I think we're at the forefront, honestly, in the country right now. Why would our numbers be so much bigger than everybody else's, though? I would imagine population, a lot of urban environments, a lot of urban cities here in the province. Yeah, but that, that two-thirds of everything in the countries. Well, let me put it this way. We are accustomed in Ontario to being 40% of everything because we're 40% of the population of the country. Yeah. Our number is a lot bigger than 40. So what explains that? I think it's a lot to do with that. I think it's a lot of the awareness. I think people are coming forward more. And I also agree with what Cassandra said in that um, it's always been there. It's that people are coming out more. Um, victims are, are coming forward um, at a... At a bigger pay, a lot faster, um, a lot more willing to come forward to police, to community partners, um, like we have on the panel here. Well, that takes me to you, because you know all about this uh, from a number of different, for a number of different reasons. Why don't you give us some of your background as how you came to this issue? Yeah, for sure. So in terms of my work, the way that I came into it was really through an academic lens, actually, where I study gender based violence. And then I began to understand how can we actually trickle that down and what does that translate to in person? And so when it comes to human trafficking here in Ontario, as Cassandra mentioned, this is only scratching mm -hmm. the tip of the iceberg. And when we're talking about the tip of the iceberg, Victim Services Toronto supports about 400 people just last year. And when we're comparing that to 
to the stats, the stats for across Canada was less than 4,000 cases from 2012 to 2022. And so that averages out to about 400 cases a year. And so because we're looking at police reported statistics, oftentimes we're still not seeing the full picture. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important in that and the reason behind that is really twofold. I think one is the criminal justice system. Oftentimes people don't feel comfortable coming forward. They may not feel comfortable reporting. Of course, there have been some improvements in terms of that comfort coming forward. And then, of course, there's the re-traumatization in the court process. So many people, you know, they may, um, you know, feel afraid if they're coming forward and they're actually sharing within the court process, um, you know, some of the most harrowing experiences of their life mm. with absolute strangers. And so mm. there's that. And then the second reason, which is not the criminal justice system, it's the relational aspect of human trafficking. Well, I mean. So over 90% of people who are being trafficked are trafficked by somebody that they know. And StatsCan said that over 30% of people who are being trafficked are being trafficked by an intimate partner. So that relational aspect where there's a trusting relationship that's built prior to the trafficking, what that oftentimes results in is, you know, fear of what is this person going to do to me? Sometimes if it's an intimate relationship, um, there's a paradoxical relationship in which the person thinks, hey, this person actually really really loves me and deeply cares for me. So there's that trauma bond. And those things can be very challenging to break away from. So we can even see people exiting a situation and then feeling like they need to go back. Hmm. So I think those are the major reasons as to why this is really only the tip of the iceberg um, when it comes to the reality of human trafficking. Here's a weird question, but do you think there's a special place in hell for people who abuse the trust relationship like that and do something this egregious? I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, after what I've seen with my clients. Well, so. once you uh, yeah, I mean I'm I'm obviously being a little provocative with right. that, but but tell us more about what you do. What's your All connection right. to this? So, um I'm not involved in the criminal prosecution mm -hmm. of offenders of, of traffickers. I used to be a Crown Attorney. I am no longer a Crown Attorney. I'm independent counsel for victims and survivors of human trafficking, which means I am their own lawyer. I, my interest is with them. It's not to convince them to go to police. It's not to, you know, it, it, basically they drive the bus. They're the ones that tell me as their lawyer what they want to do, what they need to get them out of their trafficking situation. And which brings me to the point about statistics. My entire population that I work with, for the most part, my clients do not report. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole area of statistics that's being missed, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cover the entire province, and I have hundreds of clients across the province. What brought you to this issue in particular? Well, in, in terms of my background, uh, when I was a Crown, I primarily focused and found the most rewarding, to be honest, to deal with um, sex crimes of sexual violence and... I want to say that uh, one of the, my strengths as a Crown was being very victim-centered and although I could not control the process, the outcome necessarily, what I could control is what um, the victims walked away from in terms of their experience and that was always a main focus for me. So uh, what I love is, is actually making a difference to people's lives, to be able to, in this role, stay in their lives rather than, hi, I'm Kelly, I'm your crown, you know, and in a short period of time in this role, I'm able to maintain a long-lasting relationship. Gotcha. Gary, let's uh, bring the police angle back into this one. We know about the 401 corridor and the, being a particular, um, a particular location for this. What is your police service doing to try to help out here? So a lot of our work is done um, right near where the uh, 401 is. Um, we have a lot of hotels in the uh, south end of the city. Um, we call it the White Oaks area. This is the city of London? City of London, yes. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our work is focused on there. We also offer frontline training to our officers, in particular the ones that work in that sector. We'll make sure that they kind of know the signs, know what to look for. Um, because they're the first interaction, we were speaking about this earlier off camera, the first interaction that a victim often gets with the police is not Gary Bazaar or somebody else on the team. It's somebody in uniform. So it's important that those officers start to learn the signs, um, how to deal with victims, um, know what to look for. Um, so we're, we're focusing on that quite a bit. When, when a victim of human trafficking sees a police officer in uniform, generally speaking, is that a welcome sight or a scary sight? Unfortunately, I think a lot of times it could be a scary sight. Um, and, and we're working with that and, and hopefully through training and some sensitivity training, um, that, that starts to change. Bridge North, what do you guys do? Oh, 
uh, we, first of all, uh, run two programs, um, and we run intervention and prevention-based programs. Um, all day long, I do three things. That is direct service, uh, public education and awareness, and advocacy. Uh, these are the three things that Bridge North engages in uh, in response to human trafficking, particularly of young children. So we serve today, for example, our, uh, in program, we have 25 youth in program. Uh, out of those 25 youth, 11 are under the age of 16. The rest are all between the ages of 16 and 17 although it's also true that they reported being trafficking much previous to their being identified as being a trafficking victim. And let's make sure we understand what we're talking yeah. about here. When you talk about a, a person that young being trafficked, what does that involve? Oh, uh, a, a very violent life. Um, trafficking and violence are hand in hand. Um, you cannot escape violence if you are being trafficked. Um, it, it can look like a variety of different scenarios. It can look like um, a trafficker who's a male um, who might be somebody that they know or know of that might be a little bit older. Um, sometimes we also find that uh, we find that female friends, friends of theirs, often themselves being victimized by other traffickers, uh, unknowingly invite future victims to parties or to go out with them, all the while un unaware that they are inviting people into the trap. Are they knowingly inviting mm -hmm. people in? They're not no, knowingly they're doing not it. They're not knowingly inviting people into the trap. It just not, happens. Not, 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 not usually. Gary, I've asked, uh, <laughs> I've asked lots of dumb questions in my life, and this will probably rank right up there, but I just want to confirm for the record. No worries. Is this a crime that is basically 100% men doing to women? No. It's not? It's not. It's Explain. Not. It's not. Um, I'm aware of women being charged. I've arrested a female for, for trafficking. So it is, it is happening, uh, women tra trafficking females. I will say, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I would say 99% of the victims are females, but definitely there are females being charged as well. I personally have not had a male victim. I, I know it does happen. I don't have the stats in front of me. I can't say in London that we've had any male uh, sex trafficking victims. But I do believe it's happened in Ontario, and it's happening, and, and there has been court proceedings with that. And, and I think, jump in. I think um, when it comes to gender-based violence, right, human trafficking, in particular sex trafficking, is a form of gender-based violence. And so I think with that, um, I think the stats can report said that about 97% of victims were identified as women or girls. We also know that LGBTQ plus youth are at significantly higher Absolutely. risk. And the reason why they are is because of that devaluation in society mm -hmm. that is taking place of their gender identity. We also know that the same thing is happening for women and girls. And while this is a crime that is primarily perpetrated by men against women, it can go any which way. Right? Trafficker could be of any gender. Trafficking victim could be of any, any gender as well. But I do think that it's important to take this uh, gendered aspect into consideration when we're thinking about how do we actually eliminate human trafficking because there's a much deeper root here um, that goes far beyond the surface, right? I think sex trafficking, um, various forms of sexual violence, intimate partner violence, all of this stuff is really um, the tip of a much broader iceberg that is held up by a foundation uh, that, that is really based on the devaluation of women, girls, and to us LGBTQ plus people. Actually, sorry, Please. may I just say, yeah. um, something that we haven't addressed right now with what we're talking about is the demand. I was in the life for 10 years myself. I had never one time served a female customer. I've never been bought by a female. I've only been bought by men. Men are the predominant purchasers of A, children, uh, and of B, sex. Right? So I just wanted to let us talk about the whole picture. It's a demand based customers. business. 100% it is. So we have to include everybody. Uh, I don't want to invade your privacy too much here, but oh, Cassandra, no. when you say I was in the life for mm -hmm. 10 years, do you want to tell us about what that means? Oh, well, this is how Bridge North started. Um, I, I have to tell you, I am very privileged. I, I feel a sense of freedom that I have not felt since. Um, uh, before I left my trafficking situation. So, yes, 10 years here in Toronto, in the Toronto area mostly, uh, southern Ontario as well. Um, I wasn't able to keep any of my money. I wasn't able to decide where I would stay at night or sleep at night. Um, there would be a lot of violence in, in my life and the life of the many, many girls and women that I was, um, that I was back in the time with. 
So it's it's a dangerous world. It's a scary get, world. How did you get trapped into this life in the first place? Well, I can say for myself, um, first of all, I had every vulnerability that you could look at a child and say, yeah, something might be happening to her. You know, you know, you could suspect that this could happen to me with the vulnerabilities that I had had. At the end of the day, facing uh, so much abuse, and, and again, victims, the majority of victims, the things that they have in common are child welfare system, child sexual abuse, and uh, child abuse neglect. These are some of the three major intersections. And so I come from that stream. But I have to say, it's not anymore for just those kids that you might suspect are being trafficked. It is the average, everyday child that is sitting at home using the average, everyday pl social media platform. And, and these traffickers are hiding behind these screens using it as a facade of power, prestige, uh, entire lies, and, and, and this is how they're meeting victims now. So it's not just the person you might suspect to be trafficked anymore. How'd you get out of it? Oh, I wish I could say I was courageous. I really wish I could. I learned I became courageous after I left the life. But actually, my trafficker took up with another victim. I was at what's called a main uh, or a bottom. And so that means that um, uh, my trafficker anyways took up another victim. And that's how I got out. Did your trafficker eventually uh, go to jail, or was there justice no. sought? No. Well, at the time, actually, I've had the privilege of watching police services entirely shift their position and change. And I, I don't mind publicly saying that it is uh, quite incredible. In the day, I used to be getting arrested on a regular basis. Now, um, I would be recognized as a victim of this crime, today's date. Gotcha. Let's, uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up quote board number one here, and uh, we want to follow up on this angle uh, where Cassandra left off. Uh, ten years ago, there was a bill, C-36, the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act. That was passed by Parliament. Bill C-36 treats prostitution as a form of sexual exploitation that disproportionately affects women and girls, and its overall objectives are to, quote, protect those who sell their own sexual services, protect communities and especially children from the harms caused by prostitution and reduce the demand for prostitution and its incidence. Okay, Gary, since that last decade has transpired, what improvements do you think we've seen in the criminal justice system, perhaps as a result of this bill? I think what has happened with that bill is exactly what was supposed to happen, what should have happened. Um, I think what Cassandra was kind of getting at, what was happening is, um, females were being forced into prostitution, into working, um, into doing sex, sexual service that they didn't want to do. Not only were they being forced to do that, they were then being um, arrested, being charged by the police. Or, so it's almost like a double whammy. I don't want to be doing this, I'm being forced to do it, and now I'm getting in trouble for doing it. Hmm. Um, now we don't do that, we don't operate that way. It's no longer illegal for someone to sell sex. Um, it's illegal for the buyer, which is, mm -hmm. in my opinion, um, it's not as bad as trafficking, but it's pretty close. Um, and if you're talking about buying under 18, then I'd say it's just as bad as trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I won't, I won't go as far as, to, as far as a special place that you might have mentioned. <laughs> special you place know, in hell. You might you didn't get like that line? something like that, right? No. But, um, but it's it's horrendous to see somebody that's willing to purchase another per, uh, a young person, and we and we see it, uh, 16, 17, 15 years old. They're willing to purchase that that age. Um, these are men buying children, so it's, it's horrible. Kelly, do you think this bill's made a difference? I do think so. Mm -hmm. I think that um, how, w when people used to get charged for doing something they're forced to do, that doesn't make any sense. And I think there's been a lot of initiatives, a lot of progress made with combating human trafficking and recognizing it for what it actually is. So there has been a change in attitude, you think, in institutions in the province and country that recognizes that we're not going to go after the victims, we really need to go after the perpetrators and those who seek the service. You think that's the I, fact now? I, what I'm seeing is, sort of in the sector, that, or the lens that I see it from, is a lot of holding the perpetrator perpetrators accountable. Um, I think there could be some more work in terms of addressing the demand. Absolutely. Yeah. 
How do you see it? I think it's really important to distinguish between sex work and sex trafficking. Um, they are distinct. So when it comes to sex work, there is some degree of consent there. There's some choice, right? So you're able to book your own appointments, make your own money, be able to hold your own money. Um, you know, choose. Say no. Say no, right? <laughs> you can say no to clients. Um, you can choose whether or not you're being forced to work while you're on your period, for example, um, which is an indignity that many trafficking mm. uh, survivors do have to suffer through. And so we really do need to make a distinction between sex work and sex trafficking and when it comes to sex trafficking um, you know that's when there is absolutely no consent that is when you know there's no choice being given um, and I and I think that when it comes to um, this bill I do think that it has been helpful as a whole for everybody whether they have been a trafficking victim or they are doing sex work of their own free will because it has allowed people to come forward when they experience things such as sexual violence or abuse um, while they are working and be able to actually go to the police rather than being criminalized themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's still a lot of shame, judgment, stigma in our society as well that comes with any of these things, whether it's being trafficked, whether it's being a sex worker. And I do think that those are things that need to be worked on. But I do think it's really important to ensure that we draw the distinction because if we don't, we will end up harming both sex workers as well as sex trafficking survivors. I think that's an excellent point. And also, some of my clients were sex workers and then found themselves in a trafficking situation, get out of the trafficking situation and return to sex work. So thank you for making that distinction. Yeah. Did you lobby on behalf of the passage of this bill back in the day? It's actually called the Protection of Communities and Exploited mm -hmm. Persons Act. Uh, and it was enacted um, back in December 2014. Yes, I did lobby for that bill with all I had within me. What it really allows us uh, and all of us here to do, whether you're a, a community service, victim service worker, a police officer, it allows victims of crimes committed against them while they are perhaps uh, a sex worker, not a term I often use um, but but you know that one to three percent it's a very small one to three percent are actual sex workers but we have to remember that what this law does is it enshrines and ensures that people under the age of 18 you can't consent to being sold for sex if you're under the age of 18 with this law, it's a, it's a definite. It also provides uh, exit strategies for those who are trying to get out, and it allows uh, for people who are actively engaging in sex as work to do so um, uh, free of, of any, uh, any restraints. So this is a law that actually is achieving what it was set out to achieve. Without this law, I didn't even know I was a victim of a crime. I thought I had a really bad boyfriend. Hmm. I, I didn't know. This law gives a definition, and it actually told me I wasn't the one doing anything wrong. And that law gave me that freedom. Kelly, tell me this. How difficult is it for victims to actually get their day in court? Many of my clients don't ever go to court. So, and, and I don't want to talk out of turn here because I'm not involved in the criminal process. Um, when you say get their day in court, what do you mean by that? Well, I guess uh, I, more generally, I think, get justice, but, but mm. more particularly, do, the, do they want to be in court at some point and stare at the guy who put them through this and say, you're terrible and you're going to jail? Uh, again, based on my experience, most of my clients just want to get away. Hmm. They're not as focused on holding the trafficker accountable. They just never want to see them again, and that's the uphill battle. It, 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 and if they do, some of my clients do go through the court process, but that's the least of their concern. Mm -hmm. However, if you had a Crown attorney here, they would be talking, you know, possibly giving you a different answer because they are dealing primarily with those individuals who are, you know, have more of an interest of going through the court process. Well, let me follow up with Gary on that, because I gather the StatsCan report says only 11 percent of right. cases end up in a guilty verdict. Why is that? I think there's a, a few reasons for that. Um, it, it's, it's a very difficult process for victims to go to court to provide a statement to police, um, maybe provide multiple statements to police if there's some corroboration that needs to be done. Um, and then to go to have to testify, and you know, Kelly may want to chime in on this, but it's not easy to, to be there to testify in court, to say the most horrendous thing that's ever happened to you. So if you take a sexual assault, it's a horrendous thing. It's an unwanted sexual assault, an unwanted sexual act. So think of each T victim who has mm -hmm. been sexually assaulted 10, 12 times a day, 
for however many years, if you put it that way, right? Mm -hmm. Some people in our office will call it um, HD, sexual assault on steroids. One of the one of the guys I work with said that, and I, I think it's a it's a it's a fair term. That it's so difficult. I think I think um, victims having to go through that process, it's it's hard. It's very difficult. I think that's a, a big reason for for maybe the lower percentage wise. Jasminder, I'll bring you in on this because we talked about the federal law a moment ago. Let's talk about what's going on at Queen's Park. Last year, they passed Bill 41. The protection from coerced debts incurred in relation to the Human Trafficking Act. That doesn't uh, come off the tongue easily. It's a long <laughs> title for a bill, but we get what it does. What do you hope the bill will do? Yeah, so let me paint a, a picture for you here because I think that'll be the best way to understand this uh, very long titled uh, bill. So, for example, we had a human trafficking survivor that, you know, had spent years rebuilding her life and was finally ready to go back to school. When she was ready to go back to school, what actually happened was she applied for OSAP <laughs> and she got denied. She got denied OSAP and then uh, we looked into why that was and it was because her trafficker had taken out a credit card on her name and booked all of the hotel rooms. Oh my goodness. Booked all of the Ubers to and from, uh, you know, these hotel rooms to the Airbnbs, whatever it was, all the food that she was eating, all of this stuff under her name. And then she ended up with a credit card bill that A, she never knew about, B, was unpaid. And so before this bill was passed last year, um, one would assume that if there was some kind of debt that was incurred fraudulently or coercively under your name, you wouldn't be held liable for it. Well, that's not the case, um, or that wasn't the case. And so what actually happened was one, you still have to pay that debt back. Two, it shows up on your credit report. It impacts your ability, as I mentioned, to go back to school. Mm -hmm impacts your ability to, for example, um, you know, apply for safe housing, right? So these are ways that it could prevent somebody from moving forward in their life. And so what this bill actually did was it said, you know what, you will no longer, we're, we're telling all banks and financial institutions that anybody who has been trafficked will not be held liable for any debt that was incurred as a result of human trafficking. And then B, that is going to be expunged mm -hmm. from their record. And essentially, Ontario has created the first bill of its kind, but this is not replicated across Canada yet. And as a policy advisor at Victim Services, that is definitely something that I am advocating for. However, it's not something that's happened yet. The mm -hmm. only other province that has something similar is Saskatchewan, and even that needs to go a step further. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, Kelly, we have an example here, both in the federal parliament and in the provincial legislature, of the political system actually hearing about a problem and putting in place legal solutions which are working. Absolutely, and simply the fact of my role. Prior to my role existing, victims had one choice, continue to be trafficked or try and get away, or go to police. And if they weren't willing to go to police, there were no other option. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about, when people ask me about Ontario, Ontario really is a leader yes. in human trafficking. And I'm really proud to be a part of it, especially with, with my partners here who I mm -hmm. work with every day. And uh, I think that Ontario does deserve some recognition for being ahead of the game. The legislation that I almost use regularly is it's called the Prevention of and Remedies for Human Trafficking mm -hmm. Act. Other, some of the other provinces have that legislation, but they don't have a free lawyer to navigate it. Navigating legislation is certainly not a place where my clients are, are ready to be when they're trying to escape their trafficker. So one thing that's I'm very passionate about is is making sure that this role exists across the province, across the country, across in the every country. single province. Jasmine mm -hmm. uh, referred uh, Cassandra a second ago to the fact that there's still a lot of stigma associated with this issue. So let's follow up on that a little bit. What are some misconceptions that we have about the victims of human trafficking? Oh, well, many people still believe that, you know, victims come across from uh, another country. You know, they fly here or they're brought here from another country. And, and that's just quite frankly not true. 93% is the stat of victims are Canadian victims. Hmm. Right? So so we know that. It's a made in Canada problem. Well, it, it is. It's it's a problem. And, and when we're looking at the problem, you know, when I look at the areas that I serve, because I think Ontario is doing a great job, I look and I see, is this area a place where uh, traffic victims are coming from? Is this a place where they're ending up and being sold? Or is this a place where they're on route? Because trafficking is so prevalent in all of Canada, like you've pointed out, that it doesn't matter what city or town I stand in, I know that trafficking is happening there. All right, let me pick up with Gary on that one then. If you were, I don't know, at an outdoor shopping mall, 
and you saw a guy uh, mistreating a, a, a very young girl, and you had reason to be suspicious about the nature of that relationship, give us some advice. What do you do? Um, you know, if it's an urgent, urgent situation, you'd call 911, of course. Um, but anything would be helpful. Um, a a uh, license plate, uh, perhaps maybe note the t date and time, and we can go back and get video of that person um, and the girl to try to, uh, the only to ID them. Um, you, you know, if it's, it, like I said, if it's urgent, maybe you do, are you getting security? If it's at the mall, are you calling 911? That, almost common sense stuff, but maybe not as common, but like things like you wouldn't think of, like, should I get the phone number, or should I get the uh, date and time of the, uh, I would, most mm -hmm. people wouldn't think to do that, right? But maybe being a police officer for so many years, I think, okay, if I'm gonna get this video, I need to know what date and time, right? If I'm gonna get this. Think a bit like a cop, in other words. Yeah, think like a cop a little bit, you know? Huh. You know, think dirty is what they, they like to say, so think that way. Hmm. Is it a good idea to go up to, to the two people involved and say to the young girl, are you okay? I, I think that's a, a situational, you, you know, would I be comfortable doing that? Well, Probably. You got right? a badge, you can do it, yeah. but what about a civilian? You, you know, that's what I mean. I, I think you'd have to be, I, I would suggest not to. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be the, the general rule. If you don't feel comfortable doing something like that, it, you know, you might be putting yourself in a, um, in, a, in a situation. And let's not forget, a lot of these, a lot of these guys aren't, um, you know, they, they have day jobs. Like, a lot of these guys are, are involved in gangs, organized yes. crime, they carry weapons, mm -hmm. drugs. So these aren't, um, you know, these aren't nice people, obviously, for what they do and, and what else they're involved in. And a lot of them have, you know, side hustles, which are, are like I said, drugs, guns, gangs, mm. organized crime. So Not exactly approachable folks. I wouldn't think so, no. Gotcha. No. Uh, okay, Jasminder, uh, some signs that maybe parents and friends can look to if you fear that you have a colleague or a friend or something who might be involved in this. Yeah, what do you look out for? Absolutely. So I think there's a number of signs to look out for. One exact sign doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is being trafficked. Um, it's a really a variety of signs. And I think one of the important things when we're looking out for signs is knowing that it's always better to reach out for help mm -hmm. if you think that somebody needs it because you never know what's going on. Mm. If it's not human trafficking, could be sexual violence, could be, you know, abuse in the home or something along those lines. So you could be looking out for potentially, you know, this person has maybe a new person in their life that's maybe, you know, a friend or a friend of a friend. Perhaps they're not normally, you know, hanging out with their normal group of friends. Perhaps they might be isolated, um, you know, from their regular healthy support systems and and becoming, um, you know, closer to this, this new group. Um, there may be a change in appearance, and that could be anywhere from a person was super confident and now they're not, mm. um, to they weren't super confident and now the traffickers pump them up to make them feel like they're on top of the world. And so you kind of see that that difference in their behavior as well. Um, and, and those are some of the things to kind of look out for, you know, during the grooming process. You know, while somebody is being trafficked, you could look out for things such as having, you know, more than one cell phone, perhaps a lot of of, um, you know, hotel charges on credit card bills, uh, perhaps hotel pens or hotel cards that a person's hanging on to, or maybe really fancy lingerie if it's a parent going through a child's drawer or something along those lines. Um, so these are all some of the things that I would look out for. But like I said, you know, um, one thing does not necessarily, you know, equal a situation as trafficking, mm -hmm. or maybe even a couple of these pieces might not necessarily. But if you do see any of these signs, it's always better to reach out for help. Cassandra, I wonder though, if you were, when you were in the midst of that life, mm -hmm. if somebody had come up to you and said, are you okay? Do you need help? Are you in trouble? Uh, what kind of answer would you have given them at that time? Like many, many victims. Many victims don't realize they're being trafficked while they're being trafficked. So for somebody to come in and say, you know, do you need help? I would have been like, nah, from what? Right? I wasn't able to see the signs that I was being trafficked. Mm. And so I think that um, some other important things to, to recognize when we're looking at signs of people that are being trafficked is there's really four stages of exploitation. Somebody who is at risk of being trafficked, somebody who's transitioning in to being trafficked, so they're being groomed, there's somebody who is paying attention to them, and they're in great danger, then they, they, you're entrenched. You're stuck in the life, you're entrenched in it. And the last stage is to transition away. So depending on what stage somebody is in is gonna depend on the warning signs that we are looking for. One of the biggest problems that Bridge North faces as an organization is we'll get a call and we'll, we'll hear, I think this person's being trafficked. By the time we run our assessments, by the time we, we look at, at this whole picture, this youth has been already being trafficked for two to three years, hmm. mm -hmm. right? So, so uh, we know that looks are very deceiving when it comes to trafficking. It is all, it's a smoke and mirrors game. 
Okay, we're less than uh, two minutes to go here, and I, uh, I want to ask you this. There's every possibility right now that somebody in this province who's being trafficked is watching this discussion mm -hmm. or is listening to it on a, pod, a podcast or whatever. I if they think they're in the midst of this and they want to get out of it, what do they do? Absolutely. I have to tell you the very first thing, hold on to hope. The main reason a lot of victims don't actually leave the life is because this hopeless feeling is so sinking. Hold on to that hope and know Kelly is here, Gary is here, Jasminder is here, Cassandra is here, and there's so many more that are not here right now, Steve, mm -hmm. that even if they don't feel like they're ready to get out, call us and talk about what it might be like to get out. Mm -hmm. Forget about getting out of the life, because when you ask somebody, you know, do you want to get out of the life? Many, they're really asking me many questions. Where am I gonna get food from? Where am I gonna sleep tonight? Mm -hmm. What am I gonna eat? I have no friends. I have nowhere to go. So this one question I would say is, don't ask, do you wanna get out? Instead, what can I do for you today? Outstanding. This was extremely educational and I wanna thank the four of you for coming into TVO tonight and really helping us out with this. Uh, Kelly Beale, the uh, former Crown Counsel, and Cassandra Diamond, founder and director of Bridge North Advocacy on the right-hand side of the table. Jasminder Sekhon, policy advisor, victim services here in Toronto, and Gary Bazaire, human trafficking unit, London Police Service. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so thank you. much. Thank you. Headlines about climate change can feed a sense of doom and despair. Tonight, three experts discuss the need for optimism and action in our messaging to the next generation. Increasingly in recent years, there are a lot of people with negative thoughts with regard to, to the future. something that in my waning days um, that I can no longer do too much about other than to continue to, to project some sort of positivity. I actually saw one piece in particular that was about how some university campuses are bringing in therapists specifically to deal with eco-anxiety in the students and the way they were describing the sort of treatment or the kind of therapy approach was almost like trying to come to terms with a terminal illness, having like finding peace with um, the environment dissolving around us. And I felt so angry when I read that piece and also just so disappointed because if, if instead of inspiring people to act, we're asking them to accept that the world is on the decline, I, I think, you know, that's not the right message. We know exactly what to do to save the planet and stop climate change, and, and today it's a political problem. Politicians now have got to be thinking not of the next election or of Ottawa, but of Canada and the world. We have a, a small contingent here. Laurentian is now a nature-positive university, thinking about climate change positively. And there are 120 universities across the world that are doing that. That's, that's what still gives me hope, that there, is, that there are people out there who, who, who get it. Now all we have to do is get the politicians to get it. People who are developing policy are not listening to the facts. So you need to be able to communicate the facts to that audience. But the audience that um, is really going to count in the future, it's going to be youth. Youth don't need facts. What they need is inspiration. They need to, to hear the stories of recovery, like the fin whale and, and the blue whale at the moment that are increasing in population, like around Sudbury here, where the trees have changed the, the landscape. We've planted 10,100,000 trees around Sudbury. And the, um, the air quality is vastly better. The emissions from the, from the smelters are about 2% of what they used to be. It's those stories of hope that young people need to hear. 
So how to bring people to care about conservation is something I'm obsessed with and I think about all the time. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. One is everybody, no matter how they're, they vote politically or who they choose to you know, represent them, can enjoy watching the stars at night, often likes to garden, thinks their pet is a part of their family, appreciates nature with the same enthusiasm and level of passion. So it can sometimes be disheartening to know that none of us as individuals is going to solve one of these crises. The most we can do is bring environmental issues, and I don't mean the most as in like, sadly, the most we can do. I mean, the most we can all do is bring it into our conversations and vote with our ideals in mind and hold our elected officials accountable to make those big institutional changes, to regulate industry, to make it such that we don't have to make the choice at the grocery store, which is the sustainable choice and which is not. They should all be sustainable choices. What I really, really, really want to see is that we untie the knot that right now is tying environmental preservation and, and regulation to one side of the political aisle and not the other, and to make it more of this kind of stewardship story and, and doing good works to um, enrich our own local environments and then ultimately the global environment. There's a wildlife biologist in California, Phil Pister was his name, and he was a fisheries biologist, so in charge of managing game fish, but also endangered species and other uh, fish species. And there are a bunch of really isolated lakes in um, California that were left after a glacial recession. And there are some fish species that are only found in one or a couple of these lakes. And there's a fish species called Owen's pupfish that's one of these um, examples. And it was isolated to a room-sized pond uh, in, oh gosh, I hesitate to put a year on it, late 60s maybe? Um, and it started to dry up one year. And so some colleagues came into Phil's office and said, if we don't act now, fish slough is going to dry up and all the Owens pupfish will go extinct. And so he got in his truck with these colleagues, drove out, and they tried to get all the remaining fish that were still alive into kind of a deep area of the slough where they could pen them off and keep them safe. They did as much as they could. His colleagues left and he decided to go check on them one more time. And he went and realized that they were dying because they had chosen a, a place in the slough where there wasn't enough oxygen and enough sort of flow of the water. And so he got some buckets from his truck and some aerators and he took every living individual he could find and he put them in those buckets. And he carried the buckets back to his truck and to another nearby pond where they would do better. But he had this thought as he was carrying the fish to his truck that if he tripped and he spilled those buckets, he would be responsible, he alone, for you know, causing the extinction of this species. I knew this, the only place, at least I'm quite sure this was true, the only place that they existed anywhere. And I had the only fish in these buckets. Mm -hmm. And if something had gone wrong, as I mentioned in the article I wrote for Natural History Magazine, if I tripped and these fish, the species would be extinct now. It's just that, that ragged edge of extinction. And I just, it's the most profound story because in, in many ways, that's all of us, all of humans today. So many species are in our hands and we can decide if we work to save them, to aerate their bucket, or we let them you know, go to extinction. Part of what I've learned is very important is not to speak about the facts as though it's going to be doomsday. That isn't helpful because people need to leave feeling there's, there's a reason to work hard in order to try to, to, to deal with, to cope with the impact that, that they're facing. One example of, of a neat sort of restoration story locally is this enormous restoration effort at the mouth of the Don River where the Don River meets Lake Ontario. In the late 1890s, uh, Toronto filled in a lot of that area to build up industry, but also because the marsh had become, the wetland that was historically in that area, had become um, 
infected. It was holding cholera. It was receiving a lot of sewage from the city without being cleaned first. So people saw it as a pretty gross spot. At the time, it was a pretty gross spot. Um, and part of this restoration effort has been digging out and removing all of this fill. Um, and uh, when they did so, they saw local native wetland plant species begin to grow from those excavated soils that had been still and you know, not growing for a hundred plus years. When we moved here in 1972, the tree behind me had a diameter of five inches. It has, in the time since, become our air conditioner. Several years ago, um, when we had to change a furnace, we thought, well, we better put in an air conditioner at the same time. I think this was about six or seven years ago, and that air conditioner has been used five single days. We don't need it. We have an air conditioner. And I think that says a great deal uh, about the importance of trees as we think about climate change, obviously. Um, when you think that that is free in comparison to, again, using up fossil fuels that we can ill afford to do. There is urgency, and I, I also understand lots of people are, are inspired by, you know, imperative and by rage and those feelings too. But I do think we will attract more people to care if we make it hopeful and we make it about our own lives and experiences rather than just another, you know, number about the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which that news can be overwhelmingly bad and scary to face. If you ever needed motivation to leave urban Ontario behind, meet Lenore Kishik of the Anishinaabe Cultural Experiences Program. Ani bojo Lenore Indishnikaz Maingan Ndodam Nia Shingaming Indonjiba Minwa Cape Croco Park. So I just told you my name. My name is Lenore. I told you that uh, Mine Gun, the wolf, is my clan or my extended family. My sound, my voice comes from Nia Shinigaming, AKA Cape Croker. I work for the Anishinaabe Cultural Experiences Program, and I take people out on guided hikes guided canoe programs, uh, anything that, uh, that I can facilitate to help people have a good experience when they come to visit us. It's important for people to connect with nature because we are part of nature. I think a lot of people forget that. Uh, we are what we eat, so we eat, from, we eat from the land, we eat from the water, and we need to be able to take care of the land and the water. My colleagues and I, what we try to do is create an experience, a, a memorable experience for people. Uh, it doesn't have to have a lot of flash or a lot of color. Uh, it could be very subtle, but it needs to be a good time. I have seen what uh, being out on the land can do to a person. If they can remember making some kind of connection with the land uh, or with the water, then chances are they will work to protect those places. And it's not just, you know, a helping protect what we have here at Nia Shinigaming, uh, but it's protecting those places where they themselves come from whether it's Toronto or Ottawa or Orangeville. My favorite part of the work I do here at the park is taking people out on hikes and having lunch along the trail. Eating food, sharing that time, having time then to just kind of uh, chat 
And it also reminds me of um, when I was young and we would go out picking berries uh, with my grandparents, that we always had a lunch with us and we always sat down as a grouping to, uh, to eat our lunch and to laugh and to just, just be in nature, just be under the trees or in the bush. One of the things I, I like to do is I like to work with fibers and uh, just very, doing very rudimentary things like make rope or cordage. I use uh, cattails, the cattail leaves. Uh, I, I harvest them while they're green. I let them dry for a day or two and then I put them in water to dampen them and then I start to twist them into, uh, into, into a rope. And the rope is very strong. Uh, it's also very pliable. Uh, another of the fibers I use is milkweed, which is amazing. Um, so I collect the milkweed and I strip the outside bark. And, uh, and then I will take those and I will twist those into cordage. And that kind of cordage would have been used, say, for um, like bowstrings or uh, fishing, fishing nets, fishing lines. So this is a story about the rainbow. I, I write poetry and I'm a storyteller. And a number of years ago, before my father passed away, he asked me to translate a word for him. <laughs> now it's kind of funny because I know words and I know phrases in Anishinaabe Mawin. <laughs> so I can say things like your feet stink, salt and pepper, potatoes, fart, and you know, stuff like that, right? And uh, so he asked me to help him translate this word for rainbow. And his word for rainbow is nagweab. And he said to me, he said, everything you know about a rainbow is in that word. And then he made this beautiful motion like this. He said, yab colored ribbons and I could see the beauty of the language and so what I, I, I wrote it out for him I wrote uh, sunlight shining through raindrops sends colored ribbons across the sky and I thought oh this is a really nice piece of poetry <laughs> And um, sometime later, I was making a presentation at a gathering and um, I shared with the people there uh, my feat of translation, which I was really proud of. And uh, there was uh, an elder sitting at the back and uh, this, this person piped up and said, that's a very good translation, but you forgot something. He said, you forgot to say when Father Sky gives Mother Earth a drink of water. So now the whole translation I will give to you. Sunlight shining through raindrops sends colored ribbons across the sky when Father Sky gives Mother Earth a drink of water. So we have the scientific explanation of the refraction of light. We've got the poetry of the language with the colored ribbons, and we've got our relationship, Father Sky and Mother Earth. Well, if you went out on a hike with me, let's say uh, in, in the spring, like, like April, we'd probably see some of the earliest flowers to come up are hepaticas. Wild ginger comes out at that time. Uh, wild leeks are about maybe two or three inches high. Blue cohosh, which, which actually are black or they look black. So it's like these little black stalks with these beautiful little black flowers with tiny little yellow stamens. If we did something in the fall, then there's probably a good chance that we'd see all kinds of uh, mushrooms and other, other fungi. If we were doing a night walk, uh, we would hear um, various animal calls, uh, owls, you could hear loons, all these wonderful nighttime creatures. I don't like to teach people to forage. One has to understand that you don't pick the area clean. 
Uh, in Quebec, for example, it's illegal to pick wild leeks because they've been over harvested. And I don't want to see that happen here. I've had the experience of going on hikes and people are fearful because they don't know the trail or they're fearful because they don't know how to behave when they're out on the land. And it's because they really don't understand, I guess you'd call it the protocol. When you're out on the trail, you don't make a lot of noise. People don't have to know that you're coming along the trail. Um, and you know, the quieter you are and the more observant you are, the uh, chances for, for viewing animals and birds and insects is much, much, much greater. One of our eminent uh, teachers who has passed now, when he spoke of Anishinaabe, he, 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 he would say from whence, meaning kind of like the sky. And um, we are, after all, um, all of us, all of us human beings are made of stardust. And my father's translation is the one I like the best. Anishinaabe, Anishinaabek means good earthling or good earth being. And when I heard that, it just, I was just, I was just elated because there's no hint of original sin in that name that we call ourselves, Anishinaabe. We are good people. And I guess my wish is that all people will come to see themselves as good people and want to take care of this beautiful earth. Here's a look at something we're working on. These days, we're talking about aging parents, but we're talking about it and pulling our hair out. What we haven't actually had is ways to have a kitchen table conversation and still be liking each other enough to have dinner at the table afterwards. That's next week on The Agenda. <laughs>